wait for him to fix the mic, and then we'll get started. People kind of. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Khan, and I'm executive producer at The Wall Street Journal based in Hong Kong, and will be moderating today's session on ASEAN Connectivity, the Roadmap to 2015. So I thought it was appropriate to start um, this discussion by just reflecting a bit on the fact that Da Aung San Suu Kyi was, uh, has come to Thailand for the first time leaving the country um, Myanmar of after 24 years, what an appropriate symbol that really is for the dramatic change that's going on in Southeast Asia right now. Since the dramatic impact was felt on Southeast Asia during the currency crisis in the late 90s and faring its way through the 2008 crisis um, that we just had, Southeast Asia is clearly being eyed for healthy growth today. Indonesia is projected to grow, grow at around 6%, um, Thailand 5.5%, and Cambodia 7%, just to name a few, um, as cited by the IMF. The notion of connectivity comes at a really interesting time, given the fact what's going on in Europe with the Eurozone crisis, and in fact, connectivity being a major problem um, that Europe now has to deal with. The 10 members of ASEAN have a population of over 600 million people and a combined GDP of around $2 trillion, and that's more than India's. So will the governments of Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, Laos, Brunei, Vietnam, Philippines, and Myanmar be successful in regionally integrating into an economic powerhouse? So with the answers today, I'd like to introduce to you my very distinguished panel. And as a journalist, I feel like I got the cream of the crop up here. <laughs> <laughs> Next to me is Mr. Suran Pitsuan, who's the Secretary General of ASEAN. And next to him, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, the very well-known professor from Columbia University. Next to him is Mr. Pailin Chuchatawarn, who is the President and CEO of PTT in Thailand, the gas and oil company in Thailand. Um, next to him is Mr. Rajak Nag, who is the Managing Director of the Asia Development Bank. And Mr. Mustafa Mohammed, who is the Min Minister of International Trade and Industry of Malaysia. And last but not least, of course, Malvander Singh, who is the Executive Chairman of Fortis Healthcare in, based in Singapore. Now, I thought for this discussion, we would uh, just really launch into the topic. And I like to include the audience as much as possible. So if something comes up and somebody wants to make a comment, please do raise your hand and, and I will turn to you. Um, oftentimes, your questions are much more interesting than mine. And we will, um, and I'll, I'll refer to the audience um, every so often to see if you have questions as well. OK. I thought. Appropriately, we would start with the issue of people and the issue of labor, employing people. Um, I'm going to start with Malvinder because we had an interesting discussion. Um, you have a lot of hospitals um, in Asia and you know around the world. You employ a lot of people in Southeast Asia. So, what would broadening, broadening the labor pool mean to your business? Well, I certainly believe that when you look at 2015 and when you look at ASEAN, you know, for goods, services, and people mobility to happen freely, uh, today when we look at our business in Asia and in particular in ASEAN, there is a restriction of being able to move skilled manpower, be it doctors, nurses, technicians. And many times, 
either because of capability or just the sheer supply side of medical talent, one is not able to address the needs of multiple markets. Uh, so we clearly feel the need uh, in our business, and I'm sure that's a similar challenge that many people in their businesses have, of being able to move talent within markets in order to service the needs in their respective sectors. Uh, and I see this to be a challenge which is there currently, and from my understanding and from some of the leading people sitting here, I believe this will probably be the first issue to get addressed in terms of mobility, but it will happen over a period of time. And from a viewpoint of business, uh, you know, we clearly would want to see this happening earlier than later, because then you can have skilled manpower being able to move and be able to go into markets where you can provide the right services. So be it in Thailand or in Indonesia or in Hong Kong or Singapore, you freely can't move doctors, you can't move nurses, and those those, that creates scarcity and thereby creates a much higher price point than what would happen if you had manpower movement happening and thereby us being able to provide higher quality capability and service at a lower price, which will reduce the cost of healthcare and give better, give better service and better offerings to people. So I would just say that the sooner we do this, uh, the easier it will be for services and for people to get access to best quality of goods and services. Okay, Professor Stiglitz, you want to jump in there? Oh, well, I, I agree, but let me uh, warn of two uh, downside risks. Uh, the first is that uh, you could have all the talented people leaving uh, some of the countries and, and, and converging to Singapore to, to, and, and, and creating a howling out of the economy, and, and that would not uh, be good. Uh, the second uh, has been more apparent in Europe, and I don't know if it, it, it is relevant here, but let me mention because it's a, become a major issue in Europe. Um, there's free mobility of labor, but uh, countries uh, are inheriting, some of the countries, very big deficits. So Greece, for instance, have a deficit now even still of 100 and uh, Twenty percent of GDP. Well, in a way, you can escape repaying that debt by moving. Ireland can escape repaying that debt by moving to London. And now you don't have efficient mobility. Mobility is not determined on the basis of where the marginal product, the efficiency of labor, is the highest. But how can I escape mistakes of my parents? And that's not a good basis of uh, labor mobility. So the question is, and, and see, the very big difference between free mobility in the United States and free mobility, say, within ASEAN. In the United States, if everybody moves out of North Dakota, we don't care. In fact, a lot of people like that because you can buy the senator from North Dakota at a cheaper price. Uh, I didn't mean that any personal uh, 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 way, but, but thought, it does lower the cost I of... I thought you don't do that in the no, US. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we have a whole political system of, arranged around that. So, so uh, the, the point is that, uh, but, but in Europe and in Asia, you care if you lose your population. So these national identities are, are important. So I think the, the lesson of this is that you have to do it in a, in a, um, in a managed way where uh, you get uh, ASEAN-wide support to strengthen uh, the human capital, to strengthen the institutional framework of all the countries so that you don't have this hollowing out problem. Okay, yeah. um, Mustafa, would you like yes. to comment on the labor and what that would mean to Malaysia? Is it a, is it a good or bad thing? Firstly, uh, all of us in ASEAN, we want to move up. We want to be richer, um, enjoy high incomes, therefore we need good human capital. Uh, that being the case, there's got to be some kind of managed flow of talent. If, if, if it's not managed well, uh, there's going to be, uh, as Joe pointed out, it will be hollowing out, you know, and some countries will suffer. And that's not good for us. I mean, we want to develop, all of us. And if uh, one or two countries have this experience of people moving out, like Dakota, for example, then we'll be in trouble. Yeah? Having said that, uh, it is already happening. Uh, it's got to do with wages. I mean, the flow is happening. 
Uh, it is a fact that some talent is moving in some directions, at the expense of some countries. Eh? Uh, so there's nothing to prevent that in the longer term. So in longer term, uh, we've got to have a scheme uh, to face in uh, this freer flow of talent within ASEAN. But it cannot happen uh, immediately uh, because on one hand you have business, like Mavunda here, uh, putting pressure on us. On the other, you have people who are concerned about this free flow and having an impact. Governments certainly will be concerned and the citizens will be concerned if this happens. So in the longer term, uh, there's a need. Uh, but what I'm saying is that it's happening because when wage, wage levels are, are big, there's nothing much uh, to prevent people from moving from one location to another, except I think uh, we have to manage in a way that it will not have a big impact on some countries. In my country, Malaysia, what we're doing is to uh, attract back talent from other, we have a large Malaysian diaspora throughout the world. Yeah? These are very talented people. We are, through the talent corporation, we're trying to bring more of them back to Malaysia. And we recognize that we cannot bring everyone, and neither do we want to bring everyone, but we need some of them back uh, to contribute to uh, the country's economic development. That's where we are. Okay. And uh, before we go to ASEAN, I want to go to um, Thailand and ask you what it would mean um, to specifically to the oil and gas sector to have a larger pool of labor, um, open labor market in Southeast Asia? Uh, as a matter of fact, the oil and gas industry is not a uh, um, labor intensive industry. But uh, we in the energy sector, we do believe that uh, uh, linking up all the ASEAN 10 will benefit uh, the whole region in terms of security and probably will help reduce the cost. Um, ASEAN, the whole group as, uh, as a whole, we are more or less at the moment um, a neutral or self sufficient in terms of, of uh, energy. We have about eight countries who are importer and two countries who, is ex who are exporters. But in the future, definitely there will be a, um, a definite need of uh, import of, of the energy when the economic uh, development grows. We are at the moment um, see one of the problems among the, the, um, the connectivity of ASEAN that uh, among the ASEAN 10, obviously there are two levels of the country. The first uh, six countries having a certain standard of, of, of economy or standard of living, while there's another four new uh, joiners, you call CLMV, uh, having lower level of economy. The disparity between the two groups uh, is a challenge for the connectivity that we are, we are discussing. Um, it seems that if uh, managed, man process of connectivity management is not well done, then there could be a problem that uh, Professor Sidney did uh, mention before the hollow out. So I think uh, the lesson that we learn from Eurozone is that let's take time and then let another four CLMV country uh, find some way to take care of the problem before we would allow the free flow of uh, goods, labor, investment as, as we try to envisage in our AEC. Okay, Saren, can you just um, tell us where ASEAN is at, where the countries are in terms of lifting um, the barrier and what we can expect in, in 2015? About the labor? Yes, or, yeah. just on the labor issue. Because of the diversity among the 10 member states, 10 economies, we cannot afford to use the European phrase, free movement of people. We consciously chose the words free movement of skilled labor. Now, we certainly have been conscious of the fact that there would be brain drain from some economies to others. But if we use the word free movement of people, uh, countries like Thailand, Malaysia would be engulfed. Already two million Myanmese, the lady said, 800 of them here registered, 1.2 million are not under any protection or welfare. And she would like to change that. She has talked to the Thai government about that, and I think the Thai government will have to respond positively. So there will be economic migration, big, big wave coming from east, coming from west, coming from north into an economy like Thailand, relatively higher than uh, the economies in the neighboring countries. Malaysia is the same. So 
we have to be extremely careful. That's why it has to be a step-by-step -step process. Right now, we have agreed on seven professions, eight professions, doctors, dentists, nurses, engineers, architects, accountants, people in the hospitality industry, and people in the what they call the surveyor profession, those who go out and measure the landscape. And we have what we call mutual recognition arrangements. We have made some headway on engineering and architecture. Dentists, doctors, and nurses, and accountants are still finding resistance in all the economies of ASEAN. The professional groups, the professional uh, councils are uh, making sure that they can keep the market to themselves as soon as possible, as long as possible. Some are putting up requirements that are legitimate when we were not a community. But right now, it is a community. Therefore, the requirement that you have to speak Thai, you have to speak Bahasa in order to go into certain economies, that's not going to hold through in the future. I can imagine a very short time in the future when a doctor from the Philippines trying to set up a clinic in Bangkok here on Silom Road, on uh, Sukumwit Road, and the requirement says you have to speak Thai, you have to, spa, to pass Thai exam. And the doctors from the Philippines said, but English is the working language of ASEAN. It's in the charter, it's in the constitution. You have all agreed, my clients are not gonna come from the, the tops of the hills in the north, my uh, clients are not going to come from the valleys in the deep south. They're going to come from Silom area. They're going to come from Sukhumvit area. They all speak English. I can see this tension. I can see this dynamics working out. And I can see that we are going to be forced to open more and more. Resistance is there. But also without free movement of skilled labor, there won't be an economic community that we are talking about. Okay, let me just go to Raja, and then I'll come back to you, Professor Singh. I noticed that uh, Kun Surin very wisely has left out economists from those eight categories. I think, I think that's great. I think that's very wise. Um, I think, uh, there are too many I, I, of them already. <laughs> I, I think uh, I agree with Professor Stiglitz. Uh, as an ultimate goal, yes, but I think there are issues, and we've got to make sure we recognize that. Therefore, Sequencing is very important. I think there has to be first greater movement of goods and services, and as Pa Mustafa said, managed movement, and then some skilled labor. It's very important not to rush because I think you know you can sort of you can make this whole thing a victim of its own success. So mobility of people should come much further down the chain. I think there is much more work to be done in ASEAN for the movement of goods and services, capital, and then skilled labor in that sequence. Yeah, uh, I just want to remind, some of you may re remember uh, one of the former prime ministers of Malaysia uh, in discussing the movement of skilled labor from uh, developing countries to developed countries, mm -hmm. described it as uh, the most important form of uh, theft of intellectual property. <laughs> um, and uh, I think there is an element of, you know, countries having invested in their people in skills and then all of a sudden they, they move elsewhere. There has to be some framework for, for at least compensating the country for, for that skill investment. It, I, just, I have a very different perspective to some of the people on the panel. You know, maybe I'm getting a perception, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we need to be holding back our people because they are a national asset and because we've invested, therefore we need to control and monitor what they can and can't do. We're talking here about skilled people. We're talking here about demand and supply in the world, in the region, across industries. So if we can have people in the financial sector, bankers, move freely across markets, it's not that there's going to be an overcrowding of bankers sitting in London or New York because you can move there. There is a demand and supply. It's a question of capability. And you have to be accepted. Even if you want to move there, doesn't mean you're going to be accepted. Similarly, if you look at Asia, yes, there may be a concern in some of the emerging economy that everybody will move to a more developed nation. But I actually think that that would provide an opportunity to some of the skilled manpower in some of these eight sectors to move into emerging or underdeveloped economies in ASEAN and use their entrepreneurial skill sets to create business. So investment is only going to move 
when there is opportunity. And if you have investment moving, it's going to be based on human capital, on the ability to create value and to differentiate a product and service. So I would just urge the leaders across various markets in ASEAN to say, yes, these people, let there be a framework where they can freely move. And let's not be concerned that we will have less people coming into our country or we'll have more people moving out. Because if you create an enabling opportunity, business will come. Opportunities will be taken care of. And if there are services in other markets, every country doesn't have to have every sector in manufacturing or services. If there is one market, then let somebody make, make scooters or cars or goods and services and provide them to across various markets because they are more efficient. So efficiency will enable people and goods to move where they are best delivered. I think uh, the biggest challenge is that we are at different stages of development and the gap is wide. As uh, the uh, levels of development converge, uh, as income levels go up, then there is less, less fear. I mean, that, that's the biggest obstacle. So that's why we say it is a process. It's got to be sequenced. It's got to happen. And as Surin said, I mean, if you talk about an ASEAN economic community, uh, it doesn't make sense if you, in a, I'm talking longer term, it's not going to happen now because the various professional bodies are, are still very jealous. So you've got to create this ASEAN consciousness, which is evolving. And this is uh, 2015, a uh, common destiny. But uh, I think what's important is that uh, we've got to do things uh, in stages. And a very important uh, precondition is that we've got to reduce the income gap between the various ASEAN countries. And that will uh, make this more feasible. Professor Stiglitz, I have a question. If we look at Europe and um, how did it impact? I mean, when the European Union was established and people could work in different countries, did it increase Europe's productivity um, overall? Well, I, I think uh, what one's hearing in this discussion is sort of the ambiguous effects. Uh, they're both positive and negative. Uh, and several of the European countries decided that they had to intervene. They, 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 they became aware that even though there was a framework that was supposed to have unfettered labor movements, they couldn't uh, 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 deal with it. And there were two parts of that. There were some countries uh, where there was a problem of hollowing out that I described. More than 10% or, uh, of the young people, actually far more than 10% of the young people, particularly the skilled people, left the country it really was a problem for several of these countries. And at the same time, the un movement of unskilled labor was a real problem for some of the recipient countries. So, so on both sides, uh, there, there, were, there were problems. Uh, the sending countries were not able to put controls. The recipient countries wound up do, uh, imposing certain restrictions. Okay, and while we're on the topic of Europe, and I was saying this earlier before we um, were on the panel, that we had a discussion that I was recently moderating a panel in Europe and spoke to the former foreign minister of Germany who said Europe's problems today are because the countries never integrated, the people never integrated. They're really different countries who never bothered to integrate, and therefore you have an economic problem that is a political problem. And I can't help but think about ASEAN in that context. Are the Southeast Asians ready and able to integrate in order to become an economic powerhouse? And a lot of that has to do with the people, the integration of people. That's to anyone who wants to. Please, Raja. Let me just kick off. Uh I think Europe followed a very different process than what we have followed in Asia and ASEAN. In ASEAN, it has been much more bottoms up. It has been much more market led. It has been multi-track, multi-speed. So I don't think we should sort of look at the European as a model. As a matter of fact, there are good lessons to be learned, but also lessons to learn what not to do. So I really wouldn't worry on this point that peoples have to get integrated. Peoples, I think Malvinit is absolutely right. They will go where the opportunities are. We should facilitate that. We're talking about economic benefits. So the people's integration will happen in due course when people will move freely. But we have to recognize different cultures, different languages, different religions. So we shouldn't try to do a force fit here. 
Avinder. I, I would say the success of ASEAN being one economic zone is very substantially driven on the people aspect. And the issue becomes from a social perspective, a cultural perspective, how do you get a cross-pollination between the people, a comfort, a degree of understanding one another, a degree of trusting one another, a degree of appreciating the differences and the similarities. And in some ways, this is far more complex, but let me draw it down to a smaller example which some of the business people in the audience will relate to, is when you're doing mergers and acquisitions of very different businesses across different markets, you just don't go and integrate everything on one day just because it's part of the same system. You take your time, you engage, you, you create a platform for communication, you get people, get them a seat on the same table, you talk through, you go and meet people, you invite them over, you understand each other's business models, their processes, their cultures, their systems, and gradually evolve something which can get harmonized. And similarly, in ASEAN's case, you would have to go through that exercise step by step in a very calibrated manner, but encouraging, influencing, you know, basically carrying them through that path and hand-holding them through and providing them that opportunity. Go learn, understand that, go spend some time there, get to understand what's happening there. And then as the comfort and that whole process evolves, the people would themselves come and say, look, why are we not doing this? So let there be a pull from the people rather than a push to say, look, you must do that. And as that happens, it will succeed. I just want to highlight one difference. One is movement of skilled labor. The other will be unskilled and semi-skilled. And when it comes to uh, semi-skilled and unskilled, uh, there are mutual, I mean, I mean, Malaysia would require labor of some other countries, Thailand. So there, there are mutual agreements. Uh, among ASEAN countries. There, there's a need uh, for foreign labor uh, in, in some countries. So this is uh, different from the movement. One has got distinguished. There are two, two sets of issues here. One involving uh, talent, which uh, there's more sensitivities. And on, on that front, uh, there's got to be sequencing and you know, cons consultation. But on the other, you know, there's a need, a real need. And that need is being felt. And it's very important. I um, mean, Myanmar and uh, uh, Thailand and Indonesia, Malaysia, these are very important. The other issue I would like to share, which of course you're aware, uh, Europe is, is a landmass by and large. We are, you know, islands and I mean, the, this is the physical. I mean, we're talking about labor uh, connectivity. We've been talking about labor today, but uh, it's, it goes beyond that. It's also physical, about railways, about roads, uh, about the seas. So this is another ch challenge that we have. I mean, in, in, in full in economic integration. But notwithstanding those challenges, we've come a long way. Yeah? We are very committed. I mean, lots of obstacles, unlike what you have in Europe. Europe is almost seamless. The borders are seamless. But you have um, islands, thousands of islands. Yeah? It's not easy to even integrate within, you know, one national, uh, you know, within the boundaries of one country in ASEAN. Did you want to add something, Professor Stevens? Yeah, well, what I was going to say, there, there, in my mind, the real problem with Europe, in some sense, was overly ambitious in a way uh, that I think was, uh, for which the upside potential was very limited. Uh, it uh, decided it w wanted to have a single currency uh, before it had the political will, the political institutional framework that would create uh, an institutional arrangement that would make a single currency work, which would require greater uh, uh, financial integration, uh, a common uh, ability to raise common taxes, uh, a euro bond, all of these frameworks. So it was, the, the important lesson is uh, that if you don't have a certain coherence in the design of institutions, you can get into problems, you can tie yourself up uh, into knots, and the reason, I mean, I think the, the comment was right, the reason that currently they can't get out of the mess is there isn't enough political cohesion. There wasn't enough in the beginning to do what they needed to do, and there still isn't enough. They had hoped that creating this single currency from which there was relatively little benefit, I think, would bring people together. And what we are seeing now is it's actually dividing. And the antipathy that you hear from various parts of Europe as a fight about how to deal with the problem uh, have been enormous. So it actually has backfired. It's been counterproductive. From, from the very beginning, Europe 
has been built on a model of trying to integrate the similarities among right. them. For ASEAN from the very beginning, it's how to manage the diversity between us and among us. Therefore, it is extremely important for us to be conscious of that. We do not hold Europe as a model. Now it's an example of many mistakes, but in the past it's a source of inspiration, but not a model, because we are different. But this is the second regional organization after Europe, successful. But do we have a long way to go? Yes. Are people ready? I think people are subscribing to that vision of one market, 600 million. For the Thai private sector, it's 10 times larger than the Thai economy. Every economy that is functioning in Asia is investing outside of itself. ASEAN will have to do the same within the landscape of ASEAN, within the 600 million market, within 2 trillion combined GDP. Uh, but it is difficult to convince the officials, difficult to convince even some of the sectors of business to look to the future, to look at the larger picture, to look at the big market rather than immediate and close to, to yourself. And, and that's the problem that we are facing. But I think the people are more and more committed to that vision. And we have to do more with the people so that, yes, so that the pressure will come from the bottom, the pressure will come from the grassroots. I certainly would like to see governments, political parties, responding to the demand of the people. And they will be on the platform of every political party, opposition, or government. But that is a long effort and a long way to go. So if uh, um, ASEAN can learn from Europe, does that mean that you would not support a single currency in the region? Not on the table and probably not very soon. What will happen is the 10 countries, you know, we, uh, the 13 countries, ASEAN plus three, we have agreed on what we call the Chiang Mai Initiative, multilateralization, 120 billion US dollars, now double 240. And uh, it is a facility that could create confidence that something like you refer to the, the crisis back in 1997. I remember the 2nd of July, 1997. That's what happened right here. Tom Yam Gung syndrome, Tom Yam Gung effect, and it spread all over. So that, you know, the, the, the region will have that confidence of the international community. Um, uh, have, we, have we used any of it? Well, not quite, because we don't have to. The fact that we have it, and we have a monitoring office, points to the, the fact that we are integrating, we are working together, all of us, 13 countries, 7.4 trillion trade among us and between us. And uh, I, think, I think the business people feel the dynamism and the potentiality of that, and uh, I certainly want them to encourage the governments to concede more, to bring down more barriers, not to erect non-tariff barriers among them and between them, because that will certainly diminish the potentiality of this larger landscape of East Asia. Raja, is 240 um, billion enough to give people confidence in the region? $240 billion is double $120 billion, which we had <laughs> last uh, month, so that's a positive. Uh, no, $240 billion isn't enough if there's a crisis, but as Pasturin says, the purpose isn't that. The purpose is to show that collectively we are going to be together. And the region has enough reserves of its own not to essentially need it. But I think the messaging of the CMIM enlargement is a very important one. And part of the reason I think we have made sure that we are also reducing the IMF's sort of in a component, which, is, which used to be 30, now 20, is to show that the region will not break away from the international community as large. There's always this concern about, is this a threat to IMF? The answer is no, but it is also true that the region is basically saying it will and can take care of itself. itself. Europe is talking about the firewall. Yeah. This is it for us, the firewall. And uh, yes, not enough, but it is enough as a message right. to the world 
that uh, the first line of defense will be from us and among us. What and is... we had problem, our problem, I think every region of the world would like to have, and that is the Japanese and the Chinese are arguing about themselves who should give more into this fund. Right. I think what's, what is yeah. equally important is to enhance resilience. <clears throat> I mean, that's going to be the, the biggest uh, firewall against all these uh, risks uh, we're facing, and we're all doing that. I mean, you mentioned earlier, Deborah, you know, of the uh, uh, good growth in ASEAN, uh, diversification, exports, uh, FDIs. So that, that, that will be the, of course, the risk. But I think um, we, one has got to look at the, uh, the fundamentals. And this, we are all working on macroeconomic stability and the regular monitoring by the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, these things have been done. In those days, and there wasn't any monitoring. I mean, uh, 97, 98, 2nd July, Tom Yang Gong, all those things. I mean, it came all of a sudden. But we are better prepared. Yeah? This, is, this is the lesson. So this 240 billion, yes, it might be small. But what, what is more important? is to enhance the resilience, ensuring macroeconomic stability within ASEAN. And that's been, I mean, the, through the surveillance mechanism that we're having, uh, that's been done. Professor uh, uh, I, I, I think this is a, a very important initiative. Uh, one of the reasons that the money has, was not used in uh, the 2008-09 crisis was the restrictions having to do with the IMF that were part of, of, of this. And I, I, I think, uh, the institutional details do matter a great deal, and that that's an example of something that ought to be changed. Um, and more generally, uh, you know, back in the 97, 98 crisis, there was a proposal to create an Asian monetary fund that would, would in some ways, broader in scope. Uh, I think that was a good idea, and I think it was a mistake that they didn't uh, create it. And, and what I see going on now is a movement uh, in, in that direction. Um, and final point I uh, want to make is I think there are other institutional arrangements, uh, not, so, not just for, for financial stability, but also you were mentioning uh, the diversity in the region. One aspect of the diversity is that uh, there are countries like uh, Myanmar that need more assistance, and a creation of an ASEAN Development Bank uh, would, I think, be a, a, a way to facilitate that kind of assistance. Professor Stiglitz, uh, you uh, uh, agreed with the idea of Asian Monetary Fund, but you were in the minority. <laughs> Th those who opposed us on that idea were the Europeans and the Americans. <laughs> and now they are doing exactly the same thing, and they hope that we could survive, and they hope that we could keep on importing and we could keep on consuming. Uh, because of our own strength, but uh, we came up with this. Uh, it's not Asian Monetary Fund, but it is a small fund just to give confidence among ourselves and among those who would have to look into opportunities for investment here in the region. But it is also an indication of integration. I mean, never before that the region would agree to an institution set up in Singapore, a monitoring office looking into the way in which each member state of the 13 countries managing its macroeconomic affairs. In the past, that is a no-no. That is interference. Now, we agree that there has to be that office, that instrument sitting in Singapore looking around and can whisper, your current account deficit is getting out of hand. Your inflation is getting out of hand. Your budget deficit is going in the, in the wrong direction. Not lecturing in public, but certainly has that right to give uh, advance warning. ASEAN has that kind of office at the Secretariat, doing exactly the same thing. But what is more sovereign than your own internal macroeconomic affairs? Now we have to open to each other. That's the lesson of integration. Integration means you also are exposed to each other's problems, each other's weaknesses, including mismanagement of your economy. This is what's going on in East Asia and in ASEAN. I thought you know all that, sitting in Hong Kong. Yes. <laughs> all right, um, any questions before we go on from the floor? Please hold your hand. I think there's mics around. Anyone have a question? Please, this gentleman in the front row, please. Coming here. Please introduce yourself. John Kurtz from AT Kearney. 
Um, just curious on the movement of skilled labor, with which I thought was an interesting debate. Uh, surely there's a difference between doctors and bankers um, with respect to the the gap in in needs, especially for uh, some of the poorer countries in Southeast Asia. And how do you, how do you deal then with movement of doctors and nurses as opposed to uh, bankers or others? Um, is is there a way? to productively limit that so that uh, so th the poorer countries do not have the, not only brain drain, but a very important healthcare skill drain. How do you balance that? Who is that to? Anyone? Uh, to any, any, any one of the gentlemen who, who addressed that. It was, a f it was a point on which I think several of them probably have an opinion. Please. I, I didn't quite get this. Please. I, I think the sense I got from my colleagues on the panel is that they don't disagree at all with that as the ultimate objective. It's only yeah. a question of sequencing. So I think what Malvinder was saying is not something that it's, we're saying no, we're talking about movement control or mobility control. The issue is that rising inequality within and between ASEAN is a major issue. And I think what Minister Mustafa was saying quite rightly is that each country will have to deal with that issue as well and it will be a matter of sequencing, but ultimately you cannot and must not stop people going where the opportunities are. And even if you tried, it won't work. Uh, but I think we're talking about would it happen tomorrow and what should be the right sequence. At least that's the sense I have. I think if you look at it positively, uh, you have this issue of doctors moving from between country to country. There, there can be a situation in ASEAN where the need for doctors is a lot more. And if that's the case, there can be a, a country in ASEAN which has surplus doctors. And through the ASEAN arrangement, there can be uh, some kind of cooperation so that a country with a surplus number of doctors can agree to a certain number of doctors going to the country which needs doctors. So, I mean, that's a positive way of looking at it. I mean, we've been looking at the, the, the downside, the problems and issues, but it, there's also a positive perspective to this uh, free, free flow of uh, skilled labor. So, sir, and I think what he was asking is, like, how do you control who's going where, right? So, um, in terms of labor, so how do you control, you know, doctors versus bankers? How do you distinguish that? Uh, I think the, the specific performance of specific economies will certainly do the selection. It's not going to be even all across the landscape. Uh, certain areas where certain countries, member states, are strong in, they will attract those professionals. Electronic industry will have to go to Malaysia. Banking, finance, and transport and communication, shipping, logistics. Singapore is still the center of that. Automobile, you will have to come here. Food processing, you will have to come here. Uh, extracting natural resources, you will have to go to Indonesia. So I think. All of us are conscious of the fact that if we are not careful, we are going to be caught in this middle income trap. So we have to uh, invest in the development, in the research, in the design, in the creativity of our people. And those countries that are moving fast will attract more of those people in, and those countries that do not uh, embark upon that track will have to lose out. That's why the open field and the competition within the ASEAN landscape is healthy, is important, because we all know that if we are not careful, uh, one of these members are going to lose out to some others. And the external parties will certainly come and take the advantage of the landscape. A lot of them are doing so. A lot of multinational corporations are taking advantage of the landscape that we have created. Uh, for, for ASEAN companies, but we can't keep them out. They are coming in. We have to encourage ASEAN to go out and invest and, and, and move around and um, help develop all these economies. Professor Stewart. Uh, uh, I want to address specifically the issue you raised about doctors. Uh, and, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in, uh, an, in an African country and uh, I, uh, in, in my speech, I, I made reference to the fact that this particular country, uh, I can't remember whether it, it had more doctors in the United States than it had, and it was the most successful country in exporting doctors. And the audience, it was, it was, I was in Africa at the time, they all clapped, because they saw that as the success of their country in training doctors. 
And then they thought, it, it was really interesting, after the clap, there was a moment of pause, and then they realized that here they, the country has no doctors, and they're suffering, and they've done all this effort of all their talent, trained, uh, educated, and leaving the country. And uh, it was a failure, not a success. Uh, in my mind, you know, one of the issues that you raised very clearly is that ASEAN has a lot of diversity, and that means there are some very poor countries and some countries doing well. And uh, the concern of, of uh, all the doctors going from the poor countries to the rich countries should be a real, a real concern. And I think there are two aspects of how to deal with it. I don't, it's really a difficult question, but one, one aspect is the incentive issue that, that you describe, which is that it should provide a stronger incentive for the poorer countries to improve their, what they pay their doctors, the quality of their healthcare system, may open it up maybe in, in variety of ways, uh, the kind that, that uh, some of the global companies uh, are, are doing. Um, but part of that is going to require, I think, assistance from the richer ASEAN countries for them to be able to do it. Uh, they, they, they don't have the resources on their own to do it. And so that's going to be really important within the ASEAN framework to realize if this is going to work, there is going to have to be uh, substantial assistance uh, to the poor countries for them to be able to maintain an adequate health care framework. At one point of the time, uh, Thailand used to suffer from the uh, bin grain of the medical people. We lost a lot of uh, doctors and nurses to the U.S. Uh, since we, are, we used to be called the country with great hospitality. So uh, the brain drain issue will exist whether they, we have the ASEAN or we don't have the ASEAN. Uh, then after a few years, I understand that there were readjustment of the uh, education system and the government has to take care of problem. And today, I think Thailand is one of the half of the medical service. So the, the issue is there, whether there's ASEAN or the non-ASEAN. The issue is how we manage. So um, the constitutional connectivity that we have been discussing in many other sessions throughout uh, this three day is actually the same as what we are discussing here. But we might we must find a way out, and, and we have the confidence. One of the difference between our ASEAN grouping and, and Eurozone grouping is that our grouping, we have the intention to, better, to, to, to make the betterment of our Islam living for our, our economy. We, we don't have the intention of create another economic might zone uh, to, to, to counter with any other superpower whatsoever. Actually, the combined size of economy of the whole ASEAN is even smaller than Italy in Europe. So, it's not fair to compare uh, neck to neck with the European grouping. We learn the lesson ourselves and we will try to find a way ourselves. And that is the beauty of the grouping of the ASEAN from, from my viewpoint. I think uh, if you just, Deborah. Go ahead, Melina. If you, I mean, let me just look at this question in a little broader perspective and not be limited to one segment of a highly skilled workforce. I think, and going back to Professor's point when he said, look, when businesses move out of North Dakota, we don't mind, because it's going somewhere in the economy. Uh, and if we're looking at ASEAN to be one market, then Let's look at it as one holistic market. So whether manufacturing or different industries are in one country or the other, we should look at it as one economy. And when you look at it as one economy, which is addressing the needs of that economy and beyond in other markets, then there will be internal competition between capability, demand, and supply. And the market will, by itself, decide of where they want to make investments and where people want to go and work. As long as the needs are taken care of that market, competition by itself will decide should investment for automotives happen in Thailand or in Malaysia or in Indonesia. And as long as you're able to pro provide a framework to work, and it's a fair framework for investment and for doing business, then let free markets play. And that will ensure competitiveness, 
for products and services and also bring more investment in. Another question in front, please. This gentleman. We have a microphone up here, please. Uh, Puneet Singh from the BBC. Uh, Mr. Pitsuvan made a very interesting point that as, we, as the ASEAN region integrates more, the countries will be exposed to the mismanagement and weaknesses of the weaker, so-called weaker countries. If you look at the Eurozone crisis currently, one of the key factors there has been the exposure of the region to this relatively mismanaged and weaker countries. What kind of a threat is that kind of an exposure within ASEAN members to the region's growth then? Um, I, w the point I, I, I want to emphasize uh, that when you get more integrated, uh, there is more I interdependence, and that means there's a need for more, you might call collective action, cooperative action, and therefore you need to mitigate some of the risks that are created. At the same time, I think one of the big mistakes of Europe was that it s said, uh, it created what they call the single market principle that a bank regulated by any entity within Europe could move anywhere. So if you had a flaw, one institution uh, that was not doing its job in regulation, and there were several, it could move anywhere in Europe and cause, uh, uh, exacerbate the problem there. We now realize that there are only two ways of, of dealing with the problem, having a overall regulatory framework for all of Europe, which is, requires a lot of giving up of sovereignty, or each of the countries has to have a protective mechanism of its own, like requiring every bank that operates there uh, to operate as a subsidiary so that there is capital that can be ring-fenced within the country. Uh, the problems in Europe, one more comment, which are, you know, people talk about Greece and, th th in fact, if Greece were the only problem, Europe would not be facing the crisis. It's Spain, Ireland, and those are countries that actually have very low deficits by uh, low debt GDP ratios, and according to the rules of the game, as they were articulated at that time, they were doing everything right. So uh, there are two implications to that. Uh, kind of hubris, we should be aware that we may not know what is the right set of policies. But second, uh, secondly, uh, that uh, there is a lot of risk in the markets and that countries have responsibility to their citizens of, of managing that risk. And, and, and in one way or another, they will have to do that, even as you get more integration. I told, I think, I told you about two offices that we have, one for the larger region, 13 countries in Singapore, AMRO, and the other one is in, in my office. Uh, this is what we are talking, uh, this is uh, in the category of institutional connectivity. We are talking about standards, we are talking about quality, we are talking about conformance to those standards. Every year, governors of central banks of all these countries get together with the deputy ministers of finance and they're going to talk about these things, they're going to agree on these things, they're going to look into the future and they certainly are having serious discussion about who is going where and who is going to lead the pact in the wrong direction. So it's a peer group kind of uh, pressure that we are building in and this institutional connectivity is extremely important. If we don't have the same standards, if the customs don't talk to each other, if the bank regulators don't agree and can't have common standards on the practices, on the loans, on the management of their affairs, then uh, we are going to be exposed more to our weaknesses than benefit from the strong points of each other. The mechanism is in place. And oh, again, okay. uh, of I, hope, I hope that I it is adequate, and I hope that we can keep on go growing and opening up for more of a common scrutiny between us and among us. That's the only way forward. Of course, you do not have a treaty, uh, you don't have an ASEAN central bank, uh, but uh, I think this point about peer pressure, uh, um, having been involved in this process, for a few years, I, I understand how important this is. I mean, it's the, 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 the phrase is peer pressure. 
but actually it goes beyond that. I mean, there's no binding treaty like what you have in Europe, yeah? but it has worked. Uh, and um, this uh, we see as a building block uh, towards something uh, more structured and more rigorous. I'm short of a treaty that gives flexibility. This is a debate about growth and austerity that uh, Professor Stiglitz is, is involved in, for example. I mean, uh, hopefully it will never be debated in, in ASEAN. Yeah? So uh, it's it peer pressure. I just want to elaborate on uh, Sorin's point uh, has worked and, uh, and, and it gives us the flexibility without having a central bank, without having a treaty. Okay. I would, just, I would just make one comment. I think uh, having ASEAN as one economy has tremendous opportunities and benefits. And as we are discussing, there are also many challenges. Uh, there will be many who will gain and some who may not gain within markets. But I think the, one of the things that ASEAN and governments in ASEAN would need to be extremely careful and cautious about in managing is the inequalities. Uh, which will emerge and therefore how do you ensure that there is inclusiveness and that I think uh, would become a local issue at a, at, a, at a national level and therefore ensuring inclusiveness of growth while others you know gain would become important for each market. Can I, can I just add one, one uh, small point, well it's not so small I think, uh, which is that peer pressure uh, within Europe and in the global community had led to capital market liberalization, deregulation, self-regulation, the set of policies that created the global crisis of 2008. Uh, the implication of this is we ought to be a little bit uh, modest uh, about our confidence that we know whether we're doing the right policies and make sure that we have um, the appropriate safety nets, the appropriate uh, uh, ways of dealing with problems because we are inevitably going to make mistakes. I, I think this is a good point to say um, everything, a lot of things that we've been talking about, as I think everyone agrees on this panel, it's going to take time and it's not something you're going to change overnight, right? So on the roadmap to 2015, and I'll start with you, Soren, so what types of changes can we see immediately if things go as planned? Goods are going to flow more freely across borders. Consumers around the region will have more choices on their supermarket shelves. That's being seen now, experienced now. Uh, motor companies from Bangkok going to see me in Jakarta saying that we benefit global motor companies we benefit from your FTA, your agreement, because we can sell more across the region, because we can source more parts from the region. The cost of production across the board is lower. There will be more opening in the service sector. About 75% of FDI coming into ASEAN going into the service sector. Why? Because the middle class is growing, purchasing power is growing, and these people want quality of life. These people want services. These people want ease of doing everything in that. They have the money, they have the purchasing power. So you will see services are being opened more to each other. You will see investment, you will see flows of capital, going cross borders more and more. It's not going to be immediate. 2015 is not going to open the floodgate of everything, but that's the way, the direction that we are going. We have put, as far as the capital is concerned, we have what we call the ASEAN exchange, 1.8 trillion capital market combined. In Thailand, it's only 300 billion. But the total seven stock exchange that have agreed to come together and cross-listing, 1.8, almost the combined GDP of ASEAN. These things are going to open up more and people are going to flow into each other more and we do hope that there will be more investment coming into the region. We are talking about one destination for all ASEAN, 70 million are coming into ASEAN now. If it is one destination really, one visa into one country, Schengen kind of thing, we can increase to 90 and 100 million. 
very soon. Oh, yeah. These are the things that we hope will take place. But of course, there are, there are obstacles, there are challenges, there are hesitations, there are non-tariff barriers being erected. But we have also agreed that any country that, have, that has er erected the, the non-tariff barriers will have to notify potential uh, targets of these barriers. You're going to lose out. We are erecting this because we have certain reasons, one, two, three, four, five, and you better be able to justify that to your partners. Otherwise, they will have recourse to ask for compensation. These are the things that we are doing, we are putting in place, and we hope that we will have the support of the, of the private sector and, and of all of you here. Thank you. This is a bit on a tangent, but I, rem I was in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia lately, and I saw a woman who was beautifully dressed, and I commented, oh, it was, you have a really beautiful dress on. She said, thank you very much. I ordered it from net a <laughs> It occurred to me then that, wow, there's really no barriers in the world today because of the <laughs> internet. You can get everything, although it will cost you more, I guess. Um, anyway, sh any more questions uh, in the back there? Gentleman with the red tie who raised his hand here. You, right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Imtiaz Mukbal from the Bangkok Post. Uh, my question is to Mr. Malvinder and the gentleman from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, gentlemen, you all come from the, from the country that is probably the most diverse in Asia. Uh, I was just wondering if it is possible to expand the issue of mobility beyond just economics and also look into issues like culture and heritage. Uh, in India, one of the biggest issues is when, whenever there's a downturn or there are problems, uh, politicians tend to come in and start fanning the flames of racism and xenophobia and things like this. Uh, what needs to be, is the ASEAN approach uh, structured step by step uh, the correct one? And if so, what early warning signs do you think need to be learned from the Indian example uh, uh, for the benefit of ASEAN going forward to make sure that the diversity, the assets of diversity do not become cultural and ethnic liabilities going forward in future? I think, uh, I think what ASEAN has in front of it is a huge opportunity. There are tremendous benefits of being integrated, of being one as an economic zone. And I think the difference really that what ASEAN is not doing is creating one currency and is giving political autonomy. And therefore, this is going to be a journey which is going to get calibrated and move in. I mean, to me, ASEAN is moving in the right direction. Uh, different stakeholders will have different views on calibration. But as long as it is done step by step, and I think the discussion here is a good one from a viewpoint of goods and services and mobility of people from a skilled perspective, and then, and then gradually opening it up, I think that's the right thing to do. There will be challenges. It's not going to be an easy ride. But as long as there is political will and political commitment to make it happen and to ensure that there is interdependency and we're leveraging strengths of one another rather than trying to duplicate everything in each nation, I certainly see this becoming a success. And because of the large opportunity, I think today the world is looking at Asia for growth for the next many decades. Within Asia, yes, there is a China, there is an India, but there is a very large ASEAN. And we, for ourselves, because we believe in it as a business, have actually moved our global headquarters to Singapore because we want to be a part of the growth story in Asia. We want to make huge investments across healthcare in Asia and be able to service the people. I see that opportunity. And therefore, we're not just talking, we've actually done it. And we will be a part of that story and journey. Raja. I think you've raised a very important question, something that governments must not ignore. And it's a reality that when the economy is turned down, the worst in people come up. And we have all heard of reports of migrant workers being welcomed when they're needed and thrown back when they're not. And I think that's a very important role for the government uh, to make sure that such things don't happen. But I think ultimately it will be economic opportunities which will determine this. Uh, I know of many youngsters coming back to India from Canada or the US, not because US or Canada have turned xenophobic or racist, I think just because there are fantastic economic opportunities now in India for them. 
but I don't think we should ignore the issue you're raising that always comes up and it will come up and it comes up in ASEAN as well. And it applies more to unskilled workers than to skilled workers. And this is why social protection, this is why the role of the government is so important to protect the minorities or the migrant workers. How do you deal with, I think this is a good time to bring it up, um, different, you're dealing with a lot of governments who have different political relationships. Um, let's take the South China Sea um, territorial dispute that's going on right now. Um, if you are the Philippines, you're going to be quite vocal as they have been recently. If you're a country like Cambodia, you're probably not going to be. Um, I, we can go through the list of how different countries would react, but how much of a danger is political aspirations and territorial disputes, um, how much of this is in danger of overshadowing really what ASEAN wants to become? Saren, why don't we start with you? I think without ASEAN, the situation and the issue will be worse. Every member state of ASEAN has some problems with the next country. But we have been able to put that uh, under wrap, not solve totally, but uh, we have been able to manage the differences among us, Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines. We have these problems among us. But the bigger vision in front of us, the potential that we would like to work together as a unit, as an integrated market, as a strong foundation to leverage, to, to negotiate uh, with the, the rest of the world, those are more important and more critical to us all at this moment. On the issue of South China Sea, we had this <laughs> session yesterday already, but it is in the interest of ASEAN as a whole that we could also manage the issue with our Chinese friends peacefully. Because one of the ways to attract outside attention with we don't want with, uh, would be to show to the world that we could manage. We could not uh, solve the problems together peacefully. And that's why when the issue came up, at the ASEAN Regional Forum in Hanoi in July 2010, by 2011, we could agree on the guidelines to the declaration of the Code of Conduct nine years before. We got stuck for nine years. But when the world got excited about the issue, because the Bangkok Post had it wrong this morning, let me make a correction, not 85% of our trade to China, but 85% of shipping and trade and cargo ships go through the, that body of water. 85% of energy source will have to come through Southeast Asia for China, Japan, Korea, or come from Southeast Asia. Therefore, it is very, very important for everyone. ASEAN has an interest in that, so that we can, we, all of us are exporting, all of us are importing. It's a common interest for ASEAN, but not all ASEAN are involved. But we can offer forum, we can offer process, we can offer institutional mechanism in order to address the problem, and we are doing that. It's in the interest of us, in the interest of the world. And we can't keep the world out, because ASEAN, Southeast Asia, East Asia have become more important to the world than five years ago, than ten years ago. This is the growth center of the world. So we have that common responsibility. We have to send that positive signal out that we can manage. And I think the Chinese friends agree with us. That's why we are now drafting the code of conduct that we hope will be binding. And it's going to take some time, but the fact that we are committed to work on this code of conduct is because if we don't, the world will lose the confidence and it will diminish the prospect, the attractiveness of the region which will have a lot of implication, particularly now, when the world is in need of some growth point somewhere, and East Asia has been just that. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, just uh, a couple of points. One, I think that 
stronger economic in integration within Asia and between Asia and, and the other uh, Asian countries uh, provide stronger incentives for reaching an agreement. And, and that's one of the, you know, the, the, if you go back to the European model, one of the arguments for integration was to build peace within Europe. And I think that there is obviously that element here. Uh, the second uh, point is that in some of these areas, uh, there are advantages of what are sometimes called track one and a half, track two, moving it outside of official channels to um, unofficial uh, channels of people who, ex, ex government officials who understand the positions but also have more leeway for discussion, creativity, coming up with new ideas. And I think uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, the uh, various forms of connectivity within ASEAN and within Asia. And one part is this trying to develop stronger links through academia, universities. I think this is a, an area where there could be more uh, development that would provide a basis for uh, creative solutions to some of these conflicts. Moving outside of debates about territory, which, uh, which are always difficult, to uh, bases of economic shared interest where quite often one can reach an agreement. You're only talking about dollars and, or whatever the currency. And uh, that you can easily get, more easily get an agreement because there is more shared interest. So are you talking about academically like the ASMUS program? We were talking about that in Europe, right? Is, uh, is it the, something the, like that? The, well, that's part of the academia right. uh, of sharing, developing a, 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 a common understanding. The Erasmus program is a program where students uh, spend one of their years of the university in another country. That, that helps develop greater understanding within, uh, you know, and a greater identity as part of ASEAN. Uh, but I was also thinking about trying to create institutions outside the formal governmental institutions uh, things like CSIS, uh, where, where people can, can begin to discuss uh, in an unofficial way, but with co connections with officials. So it's not just a group of, of people talking in, 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 a, uh, in, in, in their parlor, but, but really having some influence, but with a little bit less um, constraints that government officials face, and therefore more of an opportunity for creative solutions. We have formal structure and informal structure. Uh, we have uh, what we call the ASEAN University Network, working together across the ASEAN landscape, and we work with the three countries of East Asia more than any other countries in the region because uh, that's where the momentum is. So the ASEAN master plan for connectivity is not just infrastructure. Infrastructure, yes, we do need. and. Uh, in the next decades, 800 billion US dollars will be needed uh, for the entire East Asia because to be connected only among us 10 is not going to be enough. Therefore, a, a study like this, a comprehensive Asia development plan put out by our own institution called Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, connecting every, mar every market, every countries of East Asia uh, with India. These are important because we have to draw synergy from all around us. ASEAN has begun and has survived, not like Europe. Europe began with the bigger countries to avoid war. They are Italy, France, and Germany. We have begun with smaller countries, but we eventually bring in China, bring in Japan, bring in Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand. The bigger countries are coming in through the connectivity and through the centrality of ASEAN. And, uh, we hope to be providing the centrality. We hope to be sitting in the driver's seat. And I have told my ASEAN ministers, colleagues, you want to be in the driver's seat, make sure the driver license is valid every year. <laughs> that is coming up with new ideas, providing initiatives, that is providing leadership. And that's exactly what we have been trying to do. And more and more around the world are beginning to believe that, yes, this is the hope for East Asia fulcrum of architecture of cooperation in East Asia. Thank you. Okay, and unfortunately we're out of time, but just to sum it up, I think our panel has given us some really good insight into this roadmap. Um, 
saying that integration will come gradually, especially in things like the labor um, exchanges. Um, a fund is a good idea to raise confidence in the region and protect uh, countries from any type of distress. ASEAN is not Europe, um, but can learn from a lot of Europe's mistakes. The one currency is not on the map. It's not on the table <laughs> for a long time. That was the, the way it was stated. And in 2015, we can look forward to more free trade and an increase in foreign direct investment across the region. Thank you very much to my panelists. It was a very wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you.